reading today is from Matthew 15, 10 to 20. Then he called to the crowd to him and said to them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know what the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone, they are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out, oh. But what comes out of the mouth <laughs> proceeds from the heart, <laughs> and this is what defiles? For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defiles a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Annie. Well, welcome. Um, I, I, if, you are, if this is your first time here today, I just want to say um, we're so glad that you're joining us. And we hope that this will be a meaningful space for you to encounter God today. Um, so there was a prayer group that I uh, that gathered on Wednesday evenings at the at a church that I was serving in North Carolina, and it was one, it was the church that I was serving in North Carolina, interning at. Um, it was the kind of um, can't find it on the map um, kind of town church. Uh, there was you could not find Snow Camp on a map of North Carolina, and so um, and the pastor asked me as pastors do when you are interning at their church. He asked me to do the thing he didn't want to do um, anymore. <laughs> And so he asked me to go to these Wednesday night prayer meetings. Um, There's a prayer group that met every Wednesday night. And so it was there, um, it was this, there I got this whole new glimpse of a rural church life. Did anybody else grow up in a rural church? Rural, I'm horrible at that word, by the way. Um, a rural church life, rural, yeah. So there was one couple in this, um, in this group that came every single Wednesday, and they didn't just come on Wednesday, they, um, they were there early even. Um, and they were always the first ones, and goodness did they believe in the power of prayer. And in the rural church life, they have this deep belief in the power of prayer. Um, and these people just prayed so earnestly when they gathered. It was over that same summer, uh, though, that their son, Stephen, who had been changing his tire by the side of the road, um, was hit and killed by a car, roaring like down a country road uh, somewhere near Snow Camp, North Carolina, that same summer. The vehicle that hit him was basically a party on wheels. It was full of loud music and empty beer bottles. And um, after it hit Stephen, the vehicle briefly pulled over, enough for them to change drivers real fast. And then it just kept on going into the night, leaving Stephen to die by the side of the road. And so um, as you can imagine for this family and for this very small town that doesn't even, you can't even find it on a map, it was absolutely awful. Uh, Stephen was a faithful Christian growing up in a United Methodist church with his siblings and even though as he grew up he didn't go to church as much he'd come for the days his mom and dad really wanted him to come you know he, sh he showed up on the big days um, like the you know the 100th um, anniversary of the church and the big potlucks um, but it was his parents um, that I knew I knew their earnest faith I knew their heartfelt prayers at that Wednesday night group. I didn't get to know Stephen as well. And at the funeral, of course, the prayers overflowed at teeny little church, overflowing with people as well. And the prayers that they were asking for God's peace to come in that space. And then there were also prayers asking for the courage to forgive those who had caused this tragedy. <laughs> Not because Stephen's family was actually ready to forgive at all, because they weren't, but because they were Christians who had been formed in the story of faith, shaped by the words of, of the confession 
and the pardon and the peace of the communion liturgy every single week in that little church and because they hoped that one day they would be able to actually forgive. They said forgiving words because of, for their entire lives they had been a part of a Christian community and had been formed to be forgiving people. And in the midst of the absolute worst nightmare, this was not something they chose to do, it was just something that they did because that was who they were, because their lives and their, their hearts had been shaped by the story of Christ and Christ's church above all, and because their hearts had been formed to reflect the heart of God. And it's this kind of formation that Jesus is talking about, probing us and questioning us about in Matthew 15. Jesus asks, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and out into the sewer? So yeah, it's about that. Um, Jesus gets a little bodily gross and fluidy gross, you know? Uh, and you, it sounds like an eight-year-old boy. He, but said another way, Jesus says, do you not understand that what goes in must come out? Still not much better, actually, when you say it like that. But Jesus isn't an eight-year-old boy obsessed with bodily functions. What Jesus is talking about is, is the heart and, and our hearts and the heart of God. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus and the Pharisees are sparring about what appears to be the practices of ritual clean, cleansing. And, and the Pharisees are pushing the traditional laws of cleanliness before eating as a way of preparing to encounter the holiness of God's creation and the life-sustaining gift of food. They would fit in well in our hyper-sanitized time, right? Um, this has been a hyper-sanitized time, still is. Though the Pharisees' concern was that unclean hands would taint the food, and the tainted food would then taint the body, and then unclean food or failing to observe the laws of the purity codes would lead to an unclean life then, a lack of holiness, and for Israel, holiness was everything. It was the most important thing for Israel. Israel was to be set apart, to be above all a holy people and a sign to all the nations of God's faithfulness. So Jesus too wants his disciples to be holy, but he asks, do you understand that what goes in must come out? Is it, is it, it is not what goes into the body that forms holiness. It's what comes out of the body that is the measure of a holy life. And so Jesus says, almost put the hand sanitizer aside. Oh, no. God, uh, no, we need hand sanitizer still. I'm gonna put it on my hands before I, I serve communion. Um, like, forget the neat freaks. The rule followers, block out your mother's voice telling you you must wash your hands before dinner. All of that that you've heard. Forget all of these rituals <laughs> that you've taken on to care for the outside of the body. Dig in, says the Lord. It's it's. It's not unclean hands that defile the body. It's an unclean heart. It's not what goes into the mouth that should concern us. It's what dwells in the depths of our being that we should be wary of. What comes out of the mouth originates in the heart. This, Jesus says, is the heart of the matter. Do you get it? Do you get that what goes in must come out? And Jesus was a good Jew. And, and for Israel, the heart was not simply an organ pumping blood through the body. The heart was this physical, spiritual, emotional, intellectual center of one's life. There, were, there was no disconnected way of thinking about mind and body and soul. The heart held all of it together in this one unified whole. For Jesus, the rest of the children of Israel... <laughs> You were your heart, and your heart was you. 
Today though, like we have a very different way of talking about the heart, right? Our conversations often veer off into empty piety and, and, and sentimentality, the sappy stuff of the heart. When we talk about giving our heart to something, it frequently means in a romantic sense, or we refer to those with great heart as those whose emotions run close to the surface, who show their emotions so easily. For Jesus and the Pharisees, the heart is not about sentimentality. It does not represent our romantic interest. It does not only it's not only the locus of our emotions or the, or the focal point of our dreams and our aspirations. Rather, the heart is the core of who we are. It is who we are, all of us, our character, our imagination, our emotions, our, our romance, our ambitions, our hopes. The very best parts of ourselves are rooted in our heart and also the very worst parts of ourselves also dwell in the darkness of our heart. And when Jesus asked, don't you get it? What goes in must, must come out. Jesus is saying that, that what comes out of the mouth, what comes out of our hands, originates in the heart. And thus what we say, the words we choose, how we express ourselves is a reflection of who we are. And thus our hearts need to become holy so that we might be holy. As Christians, we have this big word for that. Um, it's sanctification. That's, what, that's the word we use as Christians for this holiness. Sanctification is this process of becoming holy, of becoming more like Jesus. Sanctification is what happens to us when we seek to follow in the way of Jesus, when we walk with Jesus, when we strive to do what Jesus would do, when we love people like Jesus loves people and care for the things that Jesus cares about and, and use the words and speak in the tone about the things he spoke about and about healing and compassion and about justice and peace, about his Father in heaven, too. Oh, don't forget to talk about God, about the kingdom in our midst, about those who no one else will speak about. Allowing our hearts to be slowly made into, into God's heart to be, is being, letting them be remade by, by the Holy Spirit in our lives into this heart of Jesus that is, it's about developing good habits and practices of Christian living and speaking. It's, it's about learning to confess our sins and offer forgiveness to our neighbor. It's about singing hymns of praise in order that we might actually live a more praising life. It's about saying the creed together when we baptize babies. It's not because we believe every word of it, but because we want to believe every word of it. It's about reading scripture and hearing good words about God in this, in this sense, each of us is this like massive jigsaw puzzle constantly being put together or taken apart. Each little piece, some new or deepened practice of faith, these formational patterns in a space like this, these habits and practices feed on one another, each a preparation for the one to come. When, when Michael Phelps won his seventh gold medal by winning the 100-meter butterfly, um, out-touching his closest opponent by one one-hundredth of a second, when, when he won this race with this unusual final half-stroke that ended up being the one one-hundredth of a second difference, he was asked afterwards how he did it. And he said, I no idea I didn't think about it I just did it after logging thousands of hours in the pool through repetition and practice of doing the same techniques correctly over and over and over again through the experience of countless races throughout his life the reflex had had finally sunk in into into his very being he didn't just decide he didn't he, he just did it. And that was the one one hundredth of a second difference between setting an Olympic record that may never be broken and tying a record set by someone else. 
for those of us who have been baptized in the waters of the Christian life, this is what sanctification means. We practice the way of Jesus until it becomes who we are, until it sinks into our hearts and just settles in, and what comes out reflexively in beautiful ways is Jesus. In the depths of the most painful days of our lives, um, in the depths of the most painful days in those parents' lives, Stephen's parents offered public prayers of forgiveness for those who had taken their son's life. They didn't, they didn't think about it first. They just did it because that was who they were. It was by no means easy. In fact, it was horribly painful. The whole experience, a nightmare of agony, but it was no less the faithful thing to do. And in this sense, then, sanctification becomes this gift of God's spirit. It means not having to make a choice. And How freeing is that, to not have to make a choice? It means relying on the resources of our faith to settle in us so that faithful things come out of us. Sanctification means being shaped ever more deeply into the image of Jesus. It doesn't happen all at once. It takes a very long time. It takes a lifetime for us to understand and respond faithfully to Jesus. Do you understand that what goes in must come out? The language you use, the words we speak from our mouths and through our actions come out from the heart and in a process, a a heart being formed into the image of Jesus. And the words and actions that come from a sanctified heart are words of kindness and generosity and of good humor and hope and words of beauty and truth. And there is only one way to learn to say such words. And that is to practice saying Kind things. That is to practice saying, like we did earlier, forgiving things. That is to practice saying to someone in our church, encouraging things. It's to practice saying when you don't know what's ahead, hopeful things. It's to practice saying when everything in life feels ugly, beautiful things. Words that come from the truest parts of ourselves. The way we respond, what we say in a given moment, is so often a mirror of our hearts. I wonder if you can remember a time, I can, when you said something you just so regret having said. If your experience is like mine, um, that list is longer than you would like, probably. Maybe it was a harsh word to a family member. Maybe it was an email you sent to a friend or a text you sent when you were at your worst. Maybe it, you were confronted with bad news and your words and response were not the ones that you would have preferred to use. Or maybe you were cut off in traffic. We can all think of times when we like to take our words back, but um, also now I want you to think of a time when you said words that were so good, so right and good to someone who needed to hear them. Maybe it was, maybe it was at the bedside of a loved one you've always had a complicated relationship with, and all you had to say in that moment was, you know I love you, right? Maybe, maybe in the midst of um, a dark hour with a friend, um, you, you spoke what you knew that friend needed to hear, not what they wanted to hear. Maybe it was the tone of voice you expressed it. Or maybe a friend or a loved one knocked on the door one evening and, and, and said to you, can we talk? And then out of that began this conversation that changed the course of your life and theirs in some way. What we say matters, what we do matters, and 
Jesus allowed us, asks us to allow the truth of who we are to come from the depths of our hearts. And why does this matter? Why do our words matter? Why are they crucial to this big word, sanctification? Because in the depths of God's heart, there is also a word. The words that we say come from our hearts in the same way that Jesus, the living word of God, comes from God's heart. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in the beginning, God spoke the Word, and all things came into being. And in that spoken Word, God created the earth, and the stars, and the sun, and the moon. And with that spoken Word, God created humanity in the divine image, and humanity flourished, and then humanity fell. And then when all else failed, God chose to become that very Word, that he spoke a living and breathing word that flowed from the heart of the eternal trinity, a, a, a word that walked and healed and told good news, a word that lived and died and rose again on the third day, ascended to the right hand of the Father and continues to speak into our hearts now those beautiful words that form us. And when there was nothing else to say that word Jesus spoke words of blessing saying this is my body which is broken for you this is my blood which is shed for you. What a beautiful word that is. Would you pray with me? God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us today. that we might be not in this moment, but throughout all our life, in this continual process, that we might be sanctified in you. That we might not have to choose or fret anymore, but that what would just naturally flow out of us is what has just been settled down deep in our hearts because of how we've been formed. The people before us who taught us what faith is, the songs we sing, the friends who offer us hope, that those things would just settle so down deep in us that we, our hearts, would begin to look like your heart until it doesn't look any different from yours, God. This over and over time kind of becoming more like Jesus. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, God. And on these gifts before us, these physical signs, of your word taking on skin in our midst. May them be may they be for us, God, a holy thing, so that we might become more holy. All honor and glory is yours, God, now and forever. And we join with you in that prayer that you, Jesus, taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.